Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. We wanted to try to do something a little different today on the podcast. We have with us a very special guest. We're excited to have him, but he has no relationship with Jungian psychology. Uh, he doesn't know much about it. Um, but his work touches on some really important themes in the culture. So we thought that we would lure him on and see if we could guide him into a conversation about the psychological ramifications of the work that he's been doing. And I am speaking of our guest today, Yasha Monk. Yasha Monk is an expert on the crisis of liberal democracy and the rise of popularism. He's the author of five books, uh, he is a professor of the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University. He's a contributing editor at The Atlantic and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He also hosts a podcast called The Good Fight. The Good Fight podcast features interviews with leading writers, thinkers, and statesmen about their work and its implications for the defense of a free society. His latest book is The Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time. And it was this book that made us uh, curious and uh, wanted to speak with him. So we spoke with him today about um, his term, uh, the identity synthesis, so a kind of new sort of progressivism, and uh, how it differs from classical liberalism. And in particular, uh, the notion of universalism and uh, how universalism is important to the field of psychology. It's important in psychotherapy, and it's particularly important in Jungian thought. So we're very interested to speak with him about uh, what it means when uh, we reject universalism. So without further ado, here's our talk today with Yasha Monk. So, uh, I, as I was saying, I really loved your book. I thought it was so interesting and, and important as well. And I appreciated uh, your efforts to do what we call holding the tension of the opposites, which is really examining all sides and acknowledging the strengths of all of the different arguments uh, in this arena. But one area that really struck me and was the reason that I thought you would make a great guest on the podcast is this notion of universalism, which you talk a lot about. And uh, I am uh, have been concerned that uh, what you call the identity synthesis um, is actually having an impact on the practice of psychotherapy because of mm. a kind of denial of universalism. So maybe to start off with, why don't you just tell us about what what is the identity synthesis? Why did what is it, and how did you decide uh, on to call it that? Yeah, and I look forward to to finding out uh, you know how it is that these ideas are starting to play into therapy and perhaps uh, becoming mm -hmm. an obstacle. Um, so uh, you know, perhaps leading into some of these themes, you know, I I'm a man of the left. I joined the German Social Democratic Party when I was 13 years old. I had to lie on the application form. Um, uh, claiming that I was born a year earlier than I was in order to be allowed to join because you need to be 14 by German law to join a political party. Um, uh, and part of what attracted me to the left, other than my sort of family history, was a promise of universalism, was a promise of the idea that, um, you know, what ultimately defines us is not the group into which we're born. Those things are important, of course, important to who we are in all kinds of ways. But they they don't ultimately define who we are. And we are able to understand each other, to stand in political solidarity 
with each other, to inspire each other, to learn from each other's cultures beyond the boundary of race, religion, nationality, and so on. Um, and along with the quest for economic justice, I thought that that was a lot of what, the, what, it, what it meant to be on the left. Um, now, um, you know, as somebody who's a political theorist by training, somebody who studied intellectual history and political philosophy, um, I've been struck over the course of the last decades by the growth and increasing influence of what I think is a generally new political ideology, um, a set of ideas about the role that identity categories like race and gender and sexual orientation do and should play in the world that has transformed much of what it means to be on the left today and come to have uh, a really quite uh, surprising influence in the heart of our uh, cultural institutions of our society, um, uh, in, of universities and think tanks and even some corporations. Um, and these claims really reject the kind of universalist left that I grew up in. They uh, uh, say that if you stand at a different intersection of identities than I do, then I'm fundamentally going to be unable to understand who you are and uh, where you're coming from. Uh, they say that rather than building political solidarity and mutual understanding, we should delegate, saying, look, if you come from a more oppressed group and you make a political demand, I should delegate my political judgment to yours because I can never fully understand what it is you're saying to me. And it's very concerned, very worried about forms of mutual cultural influence, which it uh, problematizes under the label of cultural appropriation. Um, I, I could go into much more detail about the sort of theoretical commitments of these ideas, the historical origins, the main themes that arise from that. Um, but that, I think, in a nutshell, explains both uh, what drove me to write The Identity Trap, to write my new book, and why it is that I'm concerned about that intellectual transformation. So I think this idea of broad categorization is something that Jung was very interested in, because as he was trying to build up his theory of archetypes, he was very interested in, I guess what I would call, typicalities. That, for instance, all of us can know what a flower looks like, even if we've not seen that flower that we visited in some odd country, because the human brain has a capacity to categorize typicalities of flowers or typicalities of fish or typicalities of clouds. And then Jung surmised that there must be some kind of a structure in the human psyche that allows us to recognize these typicalities. What Jung was also interested in were the emotional valences that those typicalities had. Because just because something is different from something else doesn't mean it necessarily has a particular emotional valence to it. So the intensity of feeling around the categories is in part something to do with the individual experience, the lived experience. And then he goes a little bit further and says that the archetypes or typicalities also have a certain predisposition which he points out through mythology. So, working this around, first, it's not unusual at all for people to group things by typicalities, that that's essential to who we are. That sounds like that's a starting place around this conversation. That that's um, natural. Yes, so, 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 so certainly, um, it, you know, that, 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 it makes perfect sense to think of the importance of social identity um, in a number of dimensions. I mean, one is that obviously a country like the United States today continues to be marked in many ways by injustices that were meted out on the basis of identity categories. So certainly one of the lenses we need to understand what's happening in the United States today is to be able to recognize when there's incidents of uh, racism, of sexism, of discrimination against sexual minorities, and uh, so on and so forth. Secondly, of course, in a deeply diverse society like the United States, or even in the comparatively homogeneous societies of Europe of the 19th century, um, facts about the kind of groups into which we're born are going to be helpful to understand something about a person. You know, 
um, people might be wondering where my accent is from. And it's helpful to know that, you know, I'm a German Jew uh, who grew up in Germany in the 80s and 90s and then went off to college in England. So I have a sort of weird fake British accent that, you know, <laughs> the, all of those kinds of things help us make sense of people. And of course, they often have deep first personal importance to some people. It might be important that they have a heritage in uh Spain or in Turkey or in the Caribbean, and they want to remain true to the, that heritage in some kind of way. Or of course, they may have deep religious commitments that guide their life in, in, in all kinds of ways. And I think all of that is a positive thing. Um, you know, the diversity of a place like New York City today is one of the things that make me love the city, not one of the things that I think we should be worried about. That's why I think the notion of cultural appropriation can be so misguided. That's a sort of side point. But where we start having problems is when people are encouraged, as I, I can see that many of my college students have been throughout the high school, middle school, and elementary school careers to see themselves primarily as a result of the kind of groups of which they are a part. And I think that comes to be worrying in two ways. The first is that it can entail, entail a denial of our ability to understand each other. So going from saying, hey, if you're a, a black man in America, you may be more likely to have experienced police violence. Or if you're a woman, you may be more likely to have experienced sexual uh, harassment on the subway. And so that'll give you certain insights about what it's like to live in this world, which I think is correct. You then take a step further and say, hey, um, I just do not understand what sexual harassment is or what uh, police violence is. And so I can't uh, make my own judgments about that. That, I think, is wrong, because in philosophy, we would distinguish between experiential knowledge and propositional knowledge, which is to say that I may not know exactly what it's like to be harassed in the subway because as a guy, that hasn't happened to me, but I can talk to my female friends and understand they've gone through those experiences and recognize this as an injustice and come to have a commitment to creating a world in which my female friends can as safely go home at night at 11 p.m. using the subway as I can. And, and the second is that I think it just encourages people to construct uh, the self view and the things they hope to get validation from in society in the wrong way. Because all of us are um, uh, not just uh, sort of instances of a general rule, we're also idiosyncratic individuals. And if you're encouraged to get your social recognition, your respect from society, all those things that I think most of us crave, um, just by saying, well, I am an X, Y, Z, I'm standing this exact intersection of identities, you're never going to get the, rep the recognition that you actually as an individual crave. One way of putting this is that my brother has a similar intersection of identities as me, but I'm never going to feel like I have my place in society, I'm recognized in society as myself if I'm seen in identical terms to, to my brother. So I want to pick up on your point about propositional knowledge for a second, because I, I think that this is very important in the field of and practice of psychotherapy. And we, we may use different terms for it, but I can remember my first patient I ever sat with when I was a social work intern was a Vietnam vet. And I was like 32 years old. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd had some proximity to a wartime experience because I w worked for a refugee organization in Bosnia in the in the 90s. But other mm. than that, you know, I had never been in a war and I wasn't a 50 something year old man and on and on. And I remember my supervisor sort of just lifting that up and just stating it. You know, you, there's a lot of experience you don't share with this person, but but uh, your job is to just um, be open and try to understand. And I think we do this all the time in therapy. In fact, it's a really interesting question. Do you need to share common experiences with your therapist in order for your therapist to be able to understand you? And I don't know that there's an absolutely uh, straightforward yes or no answer to that. But what I will say, I mean, first of all, I can tell you that as someone that had children. And uh, when my children were small, I was working with an analyst who had never had children. And I do remember thinking, oh, there's just so, you know, it's, it's like, it's hard to understand having children unless you've had children. I'm sure it's hard to understand all kinds of things unless you've had that experience. Nevertheless, 
there is some some so many universals that connect us all and i can use my empathic imagination and my ability to listen very carefully to what how someone else has described their experience and that does not mean that i will be able to understand it from the inside and there may be ways that i never get it but i can try really hard and i can get pretty close and i would say uh, as it relates to psychotherapy, you know, sometimes I have someone come to see me who is a similar age and maybe their kids are the same age and maybe they're also a therapist. And, you know, and it, it's it's always a little tricky to work with someone like that because I can make a lot of assumptions that I know their experience when really their experience might actually be on a kind of emotional level quite different from mine, even though we share some of these common experiences, which goes to your point that um, that 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 um, that we're fundamentally individuals. That we cannot be encompassed uh, exclusively, or or fu- even fundamentally by uh, our say our identity groups, or even our major life experiences. Yeah, I think this this provokes two thoughts in me, and you've actually sort of evoked each of them. I think um, you know the first is that one of the um, uh, very common human experiences is to be faced with somebody who superficially is very similar to us, often a member of our family, and say, you don't get me at all, right? Like <laughs> here we are, not just with the same sort of skin color, perhaps, or the same religious background or the same, you know, you know, we grew up together, right? Um, and yet you don't get me and I don't get you because we're so fundamentally different from each other. Um, and, 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 and I'm sure that this is the case in many patient therapist relationships where you find a therapist who seems to be a great fit and all kinds of external characteristics. Um, but somehow they don't get you and you don't get them and it's not a good fit. Right. Um, now conversely, I think it's perfectly, um, understandable and legitimate that uh, it can be helpful to have certain experiences in common. That if you, um, uh, you know, have children, you might want to have a therapist who also has children. If you've gone to war and you're traumatized by that, perhaps you do want, um, uh, you know, somebody who, who has had some experience that helps them understand what it is like, for example, to be shot at and what it does to your psyche in a first personal way. That's perfectly legitimate. Um, and certainly some identity categories we're born into might uh, be that kind of thing, right? I certainly agree that the experience of racism in the United States is a particular kind of trauma. And um, if uh, particular patients have a strong preference for having a therapist who has undergone similar experiences, I think that's perfectly understandable and, 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 and certainly worthy of respect. I think it becomes troubling when we think that these pre-cut identity categories um, either consume the whole space of our individuality, that, you know, the intersection of identities taken together will define who you are um, with uh, little of a gap left, which I think is clearly untrue when you look at how different siblings are from each mm-hmm. other, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and conversely, that one kind of uh, collective fact about you is more important than the other. That, for example, you know, uh, I, I really bristle at the way in which Americans often split the world into sort of whites and people of color. Um, you know, uh, the idea that somebody whose parent, you know, father may be uh, a white uh, British man and mother may be, you know, uh, uh, an Indian Brahmin from sort of the, you know, the height of a caste system and uh, who's very affluent and, you know, they, they, they are born in the United States and go to an elite private school um, and un- undoubtedly would undergo certain forms of uh, discrimination over the course of a life. But the idea that they somehow, uh, you know, metaphysically, are in the same category as somebody who grows up, uh, you know, in a family of descendants of slaves, um, uh, you know, in a deeply disadvantaged neighborhood in the south side of Chicago, for example, um, uh, who perhaps has dealt with real trauma in their childhood. The idea that because of people of color, they somehow naturally understand each other, whereas, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, a middle class white person would be unable to understand this British Indian origin person. It's just, you know, you start to get into these caricatures of how the social world works and of how individuals work. The truth of it is that there's 
you know, hundreds of characteristics that each of us on this call and every one of the listeners and all of us share and don't share. Um, and in particular contexts, some of us may be particularly important and salient. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's worthy of respect. But the idea that, you know, you can pick up one or two of those and that'll tell you everything about whether uh, there's an essential similarity in the world and whether we're able to engage in meaningful human communication across that divide um, seems to me to be uh, simplistic and more importantly, um, a betrayal of uh, the aspiration of uh, those things not defining us. I mean, to me, it's a, it's a deeply reactionary idea that your skin color, your religion, all your experiences define you to such an extent that if we don't share them, there's no uh, ability of mutual understanding and empathy between us. Yeah, so let's, let's just boil down to a really small piece. We're using the word understand often. Mm. You can't understand me. I can't understand you. And there's also in that a tacit agreement that we both mean the same thing when we throw the word understand around. So let, I, I'd love to just hear, what, what does the word understand mean? And, and what, what happens inside of someone when they do or don't feel that they understand, or are understood for that matter? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, as part of the sort of ideology I'm talking about, I, I, you know, there is this claim that, um, you know, there's sort of four subclaims when you think about the sort of popularized versions of standpoint theory, standpoint epistemology uh, that have become so influential. And so the first of these is that the certain experiences that all members of a certain social group or class will share, all women will have certain kinds of joint experiences. The second is that this gives them unique insights into form of social oppression, um, so that uh, if what all women are share is uh, the experience or at least the expectation of certain kind of caregiving responsibilities, then um, they share the, an insight into the injustice of being expected to do those kinds of things. Um, and then the third is that they're unable to communicate that to uh, outs outsiders or bystanders, that um, even the pieces of these that are socially or politically relevant are not communicable to somebody who in this kind of context would not be a woman. And then the fourth is the kind of political upshot of this, that as a result, what we, what we should do is to delegate our political judgment. Um, and, you know, this might sound a little bit abstract, but if you go to activist spaces and literature, you often hear this kind of things, right? Like, why don't talk to white people about race anymore is the name of a, a best-selling book. You have this idea um, that, you know, if you want to be a good ally in a progressive political space, we have to sh shut up to, and listen and delegate. Um, and I think that there's both deep philosophical and deep political reasons to be wary of these claims. Philosophically, uh, it's unclear that all members of a particular class share experiences. Um, not all women share experiences of caregiving, for example. And there may be uh, uh, single dads, for example, who have rather similar experiences. Um, it's doubtful that... Uh, people who are marginalized always have greater insight into oppression. In some contexts, people who are dominant will, by the virtue of a dominance, have access to certain kinds of social effects that are important to understand uh, for the process of marginalization as well. If we want an accurate view of a social world, we need to be open to having insights from both. Um, thirdly, it is simply wrong that you can't get the politically salient upshot of something um, from uh, the experiences of another. As I was arguing earlier, uh, even if I haven't experienced being sexually harassed in the subway, I can recognize that this is an injustice that I should fight against. And fourthly, I think the kind of politics you create when you have to delegate to others is really uh, damaging. It's, uh, most people are not going to do that. They're simply not committed enough to social justice to engage in that kind of form of delegation. And when they claim to delegate, uh, since um, there's no official spokesperson for each uh, group, and if there were such a spokesperson, they would not in fact speak for the entire group, 
Um, what people end up doing is an argument by authority where they pick the person who they already agree with as the supposed spokesperson for that group and they say, well, we should do this because, you know, Latinos demand that because that's what some particular person on TV uh, has said. Um, that may be slightly different in the political context than it is in the kind of context that, that you're more concerned with. But I could imagine some of those flaws coming up as well, either from uh, patients who perhaps are encouraged to assume that somebody who doesn't share all of the identity categories can't understand them and thereby uh, giving up a relationship with a therapist that might be very helpful. But I could also imagine that from the point of view of a therapist who um, uh, assumes that a patient who shares a certain identity category has the same worldview as them, or who, when they're dealing with a patient who doesn't have the same identity category, ends up uh, 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 sort of essentializing what their view must be like, what their uh, experience of the world must be like, uh, what kind of trauma they must have undergone by imposing these simplistic uh, political categories uh, on the patient. Uh, and rather than listening to them carefully, making assumptions and shortcuts about who they are in the world. Uh, I, I could imagine a, a good amount of a patronizing and quite damaging behavior coming from that kind of set of assumptions. I'd also like to say that um, patients with certain kinds of personality disorders generally and frequently come in and say, well, you couldn't possibly understand me, and that they require such a rarefied and specialized person who could ascend to even hoping to understand their uniqueness or understand their experience, and that's associated with substantial narcissistic characteristics. So underneath the entire statement of you couldn't possibly understand me is something Jungians called inflation. That there's an over-identification with some kind of an archetypal content, which is exactly what you're saying, Yasha, that there are categories that seem to take on a life of their own. Let's say the victim. I have been victimized in a particular way. And while that's a horrible personal experience, some people can feel inflated. Some people can feel that they have a remarkable status or destiny because of the way that they've been victimized. And so you could not possibly ascend or reach into my experience. And it's foolish for you to even attempt to. And Inherent in the belief is, your attempt to understand me is outrageous. How dare you understand me? That is that's really part interesting. part of that narcissistic piece. That is really interesting. So I, I have two thoughts on this. I mean, one is that I really worry about um, how this ideology ends up being a trap uh, for... Uh, a lot of individuals in general, I see it with my students who are very thoughtful people who really want to think about the world, but who've just been encouraged to see themselves and perceive the world in a particular way. But I wonder whether people uh, with uh, certain risks in their personality profile may be particularly ill served by that. So let me give you an example. You know, on the reverse side of the NYU student card, you now have three telephone numbers. The first is a telephone number to call in case of medical emergency. The second is um, uh, a number to call in case of some kind of public order threat, if there's an active shooter, God forbid, on campus, for example. And the third is a number to call if, anonymously, if you wish, for a biased response team if you feel that you've undergone a microaggression. Um, and uh, what this does is to suggest to students that there are people in this community who are out to get you. You are going to experience these forms of uh, discriminatory or racist or sexist behavior. And when you do, you should catastrophize about it and call somebody in to go and investigate and so on. Now, you know, there are some people, uh, I, I don't know the, the right language, but with a victim complex or with a persecution uh, fear or who feel that they're always being targeted. And here you're giving them a socially sanctioned structure. You're cultivating um, to not it. Just in, 
yeah, not just to encourage them to see themselves in those terms, but to be socially celebrated for speaking out and 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 doing something about that. Um, and and if you think that uh, giving into those instincts that some people may have in terms of a personality profile is bad for them, then the first victim of this. Uh, 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 of this social practice is not just the academic freedom that gets restrained or the possible person who ends up with this investigation about an anonymous complaint they might not even know what they said and so on on their hands but it's the person who makes that call who's being encouraged to see themselves as continually vulnerable I think that's a broader problem with some of the uh, sloppy language and literature on sort of implicit bias and so on this idea that you know um uh you know even people who seem uh you know have override political commitments and so on are secretly racist are secretly bigoted they have secret biases i think that might make some people paranoid about themselves but it also sends a terrible message to people who do come from vulnerable groups, to say that colleague who's nice to you, who 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 treats you warmly, etc. You know, deep in the mind, they hate you just as much as you know the worst kind of racist. Um, that gives you, you know, that is not a set of assumptions that a society that wants to have people feel inclusion and belonging should should encourage when it's not scientifically well founded. And that kind of paranoia is generally thought of as a projection that people that have an enormous amount of unconscious aggression have a tendency to fantasize that other people are aggressive people that mm. actually are intensely hostile will have a tendency to accuse other people of secret hostilities so as freud often said is the thing that you deny is the thing that you are constantly thinking about and if you're thinking about that all the time it probably has more to do with you than the other person but there isn't a lot of realm for that self-reflective capacity. That ability to look at oneself is tremendously interfered with, which goes back to your concern, Lisa, that if we are seduced into thinking that all of our problems can be solved by hammering on the external environment, and that everything that's happening inside of us is innocent, mushy, childlike, and undefined until the right environment then tells me who I am, we're lost. Yeah. We've, we've lost the whole human endeavor. Yeah. Yes. I, I, think, that's, I think that's right. Um, Joseph, I want to go back and pick up your excellent question about what do we mean by understanding? And I'm thinking about how we conceptualize understanding in a clinical environment in the kind of uh, therapeutic dyad. And, and I would say that the thing about understanding is that all of us have things of which we are unconscious about ourselves. And the thing about um, the identity synthesis, I like to use your term, Yasha, is uh, it kind of, it sort of indicates that we can know ourselves through our identities, and that is a fully just egoic process. There's no room for the unconscious. That there might be things, I mean, it, really, why does anyone go into analysis to discover things about themselves that are unconscious. And that is a very slow, individual, organic process that we engage in with someone when we do this work. So, um, you know, there's a lot about ourselves that is unknowable, that cannot be known by uh, just identifying which identity groups we're in. And of course, if we only focus on identity, it is reductionistic. It removes everything that's unconscious. And I want to I wanna just take that a step further and say that, you know, Jung said that it was the symbolic that heals. And Joseph, I know you and I have both had this experience that someone who's really suffering uh, is presented with an image or their psyche comes up with an image that is symbolic and it is deeply moving, you can often, uh, or at least I have frequently, and I'm sure you have too, seen these moments where something really shifts in the person sitting across from you because they've had this encounter with the symbolic that often cannot be adequately put into words. And what you know, what is the nature of the symbolic? The nature of the symbolic is that which is universal. Ever, that, that symbols speak to us and move us because they are universal. And 
it's that is why the symbolic is healing because it connects us with the universality of the human experience and if we get rid of that notion that there is this 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 thing that's fundamentally human that connects us all we really cut ourselves off from a source of meaning and healing and i'll give an example there is this um this buddhist story of the mustard seed and uh, just briefly, um, the story goes that a mother had lost her child, and she is bereft, and she cannot, she cannot um, function. She's so distraught. She goes to Buddha, and she says, you've got to, you've got to restore my child. I, I, can't, I can't go on like this. And he says, okay, okay, I'll do that for you. Just bring me uh, uh, you know, a handful of mustard seed from the home that has not been touched by loss. And so she starts knocking on every door <laughs> and every single house has been touched by loss. So she goes back to the Buddha and she, and she says, I understand now. Like this is a universal experience. This is not, um, th when we can understand that our uh -huh. suffering is universal, then it has meaning and then we can bear it and we can move forward. So if, so when we get rid of this idea that there, there, there's something fundamental, fundamental that connects us all in humans, uh, we really cut ourselves off from this tremendous source of support and meaning. And, and explain some of the harshness in the cultural discourse in the United States at the moment that, that, that I find sort of inhumane in that sense. Um, which is, you know, the claim that, you know, if you're a cis, straight, middle-aged white guy, I can sort of assume that you've always been a creature of privilege and I can assume that everything is fine in your life. Um, uh, and I think we, we can completely recognize that, um, you know, members of certain demographic groups have historically uh, uh had advantages in this country and others have historically been uh, terribly discriminated against um and on average that may mean that the life of a middle-aged white guy in the united states has been a little bit easier than the life of members of other groups but but to project that assumption on individuals that you know you have no standing to talk or to complain if you're a middle-aged white guy because we already kind of know who you are is I think both individually damaging because it cuts uh, people off from that consideration in a humanistic way. Um, and then of course, politically, it's exactly one of the ways, um, and this is sort of a little bit sort of a different strain from what we're talking about mostly today, but it's an important part of my book in which this ideology ends up being politically counterproductive in which it's exactly what helps fuel the distrust and the rage that then gets people like Donald Trump elected. And that's that a lot of people are going to be watching TV. And when do they hear the claim that they, uh, you know, have white privileges? But you know, when they're sitting at home on the sofa watching TV and they may have all kinds of struggles, um, they may be worrying about paying the next month's rent. They may have a relative who has a serious illness or who's just passed away. They may have lost a child, right? And when they see somebody on TV saying, you know, the the thing that characterizes this country is white privilege. And they look at that person on TV, and perhaps because they lack in that moment a little bit of empathy for that person, they say, you're on TV. You're more privileged than I am. Which <laughs> always is going to be the case, right? Like, by definition, right. if you're on TV, your life is probably going better than my life is. Who are you to tell <laughs> me, right? And so it's a, it's a lack of empathy that then invites another sort of bout of lack of empathy in return. Um, and, and again, in certain sociological contexts, talking about the structural advantages enjoyed by parts of the population, perfectly appropriate. But as this kind of cultural trope of, you know, oh, you, you don't really have standing to speak because you, you enjoy this and that kind of privilege. I think it really does encourage a uh, lack of empathy um, in all of us. And of course, that is in the first instance an injustice towards a person you're not empathetic towards, but in the second instance always ends up being an injustice towards 
yourself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of John Stuart Mill's argument in, in On the Subjection of Women that uh, the laws that existed in the 19th century in England were an injustice towards women because men acquired by marriage, for example, all kinds of rights over them. Um, but that it was also an injustice towards men because men, by virtue of those laws, would never be able to come into the enjoyment of a relationship of equals. Because even if he didn't want to, he himself renounced uh, 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 all of the rights uh, that his marriage to Harriet Taylor, to, to Harriet Taylor would give him. Um, but of course, legally, he still retained those rights, no matter what he yeah. said yeah. on paper in this wonderful public declaration. And so it deprives you of a relationship of true equals. In the same way, I think you might say, you know, if I fail to be empathetic towards somebody, um, uh, that's an injustice towards them. But, but, but in just as real a sense, you yourself are the victim. Because if you're saying these people in our society, you know, they are privileged and they have no problems and so on. And it's just me who has to face these struggles. Um, that I think is something that, um, you know, doesn't uh, encourage a healthy attitude towards life and towards your own place in the world for yourself because you're failing to recognize this, this insight about, um, about the, the history of loss. We want to take a minute to remind you, as ever, to like, subscribe, follow, write us a review. These things all help us build an audience. Also, if you're interested in gaining, getting additional content every week, you can become a patron. Head on over to our website, thisunionlife.com, click on podcast, and there you'll see a link to our Patreon page. You can choose to support us for just a small amount each month, and you get benefits such as um, extra episodes. Uh, today, we recorded a really interesting uh, mini episode where we talked about integrating trauma according to a Jungian framework. So if you'd like those extra episodes, um, do check that out. And finally, I want to remind you about Dream School. For the month of December, we have a special offer. You can join Dream School for a dis at a discount of 10%. So go to thisunionlife.com, scroll down a little bit, you'll see Dream School. And uh, just use the code HOLIDAY2023 at checkout, and that's HOLIDAY with an H. We also have something else exciting this month, uh, we are introducing a gift subscription so you can give the gift of dreams and just be sure to click the one payment option and there's a little box that says, is this a gift? And then you can gift dream school to your loved ones for the holiday. So thank you very much. Well, it seems to me that one of the things we're talking about is when observations are harvested about anything, just distinctions. You're a white guy, you're an African-American woman, you're an Irish person, your hair is red, your hair is black, you're chubby, you're skinny. We're capable of making all these distinctions about everything. In fact, that's why human beings have developed a kind of mastery. We can make distinctions between things, but more importantly, we have a capacity to decide which distinctions are meaningful and which are meaningless. Because there's a bazillion differences between the three of us right now. We could, we could find 150 differences just by looking at each other, but what of those are actually significant in any way is where things become incredibly distorted. That said, when we find a distinction and we verbalize it. When the distinction becomes an accusation, a different part of the psyche is activated. And so somebody could say the same thing mm. and make you think that, ah, oh, Lisa, your silver locks, oh, you've got silver hair. That's a distinction. But you could be accused of having silver hair you could be venerated for having silver hair. Someone could be curious about your silver hair. But it is particularly the power of accusation. And that's been demonstrated since, since the beginning of civilization. And is particularly part of the way that this is being harnessed in the political realm and also in social media. It's not just that I can see or identify it, but that I'm accusing you of it. And that, as subtle as it is, that 
moves masses of people both being frightened of being accused of whatever the heck that is, but also wanting to join in the destruction or punishment of the one who is accused, regardless of what they're being accused of. It is the accusation itself, the spirit of accusation itself. Archetypally, there are these ancient ideas that when you die, you go to heaven, and two angels will sit to the right and left of you, and one will be the accusing angel who will accuse you of everything that you've ever done before God's throne, and the other is a defending angel who will actually support and verbalize all the good things that you've done, and then God will sit in judgment. So the power of the accusing one is very much what we're talking about, and I think we're seeing that politically used to great advantage. So I'm not sure what to do about that, other than to know that that's true, and it's part of the scapegoating archetype, and the well, idea and that I, what I accuse people of sends it away from me. Go ahead. Right. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think this builds on what you were just saying and, and what you said before, too, about projection. And, um, mm. you, you know, Yash, I'm thinking about what you said a minute ago about how when we do this, we we cut off a relation. It hurts both people, right? It it. it um, it, it, it doesn't allow us to have a relationship um, with other people kind of as equals because we're in this kind of hierarchy and, and we've, we've sort of separated us out. Um, and, and it also doesn't allow us to have a full relationship with ourself because we've taken these unknown, rejected parts of ourselves and put them, projected them out there and said, I am... I am only this. I am only what I know of. I'm only conscious. And we can't get curious about those very unique things that make us an individual and, uh, and look for that understanding of the rejected parts of ourself. Uh, rather, rather they're, they're all projected out there. So I think I'm just going back to this notion of, of projection, Joseph, that you brought up before sure. and how important it is to withdraw those so that we can have that full experience and relationship with ourselves. Yeah, you know, I have a thought that's perhaps a little bit further afield, but, but, but when we talk about the sort of psychological pitfalls, the ways in which it encourages some of the worst sides of ourselves, there's, there's, there's a kind of more straightforward level at which this is also true, um, which is that, um, you know, one of the basic psychological instincts that people have and that all societies have to manage and particularly deeply ethnically and religiously diverse societies have to manage is uh you know in group bias is the tendency that uh, we all have as humans to say you know here's some line between who we are and who they are mm -hmm. and anybody who's a member of us uh, might be treated with consideration and altruism and courage, but anybody who's a member of them doesn't deserve the same thing. Um, and, you know, any decent political ideology, uh, any decent set of political norms has to mitigate uh, that tendency to some extent, has to make sure that we expand the circle of who we think of as us in certain ways and that we continue to treat with decency those who don't fall in that category. And I think what's strange about the identity trap is that it gives, in the same way in which it gives a set of permissions to scapegoat or to project or to say, mm -hmm. you are a bad person who means ill for me. I think it gives a set of permissions for the simplest form of this in-group bias, hmm. for saying that, That's you know, yeah. um, if you're just acting on behalf of a particular kind of tribal identity group, um, even beyond asking for justice or asking for redress of historical injustices, but but simply as you know, this is who we are, and we're gonna, you know, it's 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 dressed up in these progressive clothes, but it is the oldest human instinct, and it is one of which nothing productive has ever been wrought. It is one that virtually always has. Uh, been used in uh, 
uh, by, by, by the far right and by, by nationalists mm -hmm. and by uh, religious fanatics and by people who uh, want to disclaim the interests of anybody who's not a member of a group in order to justify plunder and, and war and exploitation. And Jonathan Haidt's work really goes into that wonderfully in The Righteous yes. Mind and Tribalism. Yeah. Well, and, and you talk about that in, in your book, too, about uh, that humans are groupish, which, of course, is, is really supported by a lot of uh, social science uh, research. And, uh, and again, I think that the beauty of art, the beauty of um, psychoanalysis is that it can help us to transcend that groupishness and to appeal to the higher uh, place where where we're all connected and so to to find this um ideology uh really gaining a foothold that denies that is is concerning to me and i think that what we're talking about is we all have a predisposition for literalism so when people group themselves together and say well we're a subgroup because we all worked in the sewing factory that burned down or we all had we all had to walk 20 miles to get to school or we all had to live in this part of the country and so there's a very literal events of our life you can't know anything because these six literal events happened to me and that's true i literally did not physically do that but what's discounted is that we only have so many variations of emotions. And so I, I didn't have that literal experience of being denied for that promotion, but I do know what it's like to be disregarded. I know what it's like to be dismissed. I know what it's like to be devalued. I know what it's like to be financially anxious. I know what it's like for my feet to hurt. I know what it's like to be frightened, that emotions are universals, and the whole narrative that you can't understand me only exists if emotion is totally irrelevant and extracted from the narrative. So That's to me, point. there is a really a desouling, perverse a manipulation of the experience, because your experience is only the physical events that happen to your body having nothing to do with how you experience that. And something that else that we really focus on as Jungians is holding what we call a symbolic attitude, which is that any particular experience that any of us have had has a universal component, as Lisa was saying. There's something universal about all losses. There's something universal about death in all cultures, no matter how it comes to us. And yet, thinking symbolically or metaphorically is a higher order of thinking. And so that transition from literalism even to metaphor involves a certain kind of asset, a certain quality of self-awareness that is discouraged greatly by the same systems that you're talking about. So convincing people that they are only the literal experiences they've had makes them vulnerable to being categorized in these ways. Denigrating or making their own emotions irrelevant allows them to be more vulnerable in that way. The last thing I would say well, is that... The, I'm sorry, again. No, just, you know, I've really enjoyed this conversation for, for many reasons. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I learned more about how I myself think about these topics. I learned a lot more about Jungian analysis. Um, but, but one of the things I say in my book is that I don't think that this ideology will ultimately win, despite the very real power it now has over public policy, over pedagogical practices in our schools, over the way in which diversity trainings are held and corporations, lots of things we, we sort of didn't talk about in detail today, is that there is a very broad set of moral and religious traditions 
that I think reject the mm -hmm. basic assumption of this ideology. And I talk a little bit in the book about some of those traditions, um, from Buddhism, actually, to, to, to Christianity, from conservatism to Marxism. I myself am a philosophical liberal, I think, for reasons why these ideas uh, go against migraine is that I think we have historically made progress when we've recognized areas in which we have failed to live up to the universalist promises of the United States Constitution, but in which we haven't dismissed them and ripped them up and said that how people should be treated should depend on that, but rather insisted on living up to them. That is how we've made progress on gay rights, and it's how we've made progress on uh, everything from the abolition of slavery to Uh, civil rights in, in, in one of the proudest American political traditions, which goes, in my mind, from Frederick Douglass to Martin Luther King Jr. to, in, in certain respects, Barack Obama. But I didn't realize that the Jungian tradition is uh, one of those. And so I feel like I've yes. learned about yet another yes. important tradition that for reasons that are internal to itself and its own view of a world and its own contribution it can make, says, hang on a second, these ideas that say, reject the universal What really matters is this group you're born into, just just as violence to 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 that rich tradition, and that's something I I didn't understand before this conversation, and so I'm particularly grateful to this conversation for having learned that. That's well, wonderful. We're, to we're have grateful you to this. you. Yes. yes, thank you. So and much. Uh, and of course, I'll I'll just make a, a last explicit plug. I think I referred to it earlier, but one of Jung's perhaps the key idea that sets him apart is the collective unconscious which is the universal human substrate. So, yeah, it is. Uh, you're, you're right, Yasha, we're another strain. So thank you so much for coming, and uh, we wish you best of luck with this terrific book. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Today's dream comes from a 59-year-old woman who is a designer and visual artist, and she titled her dream, Netted Crow. And here's the dream. There were three black crows standing side by side. The crow in the center was caught and entangled in a net, and the crows on either side were tugging and struggling to free the crow in the center, and it was the one in the middle that was caught in the net. So she notes uh, that she has concerns about her future as related to age, retirement. I've, she says, I've always wanted a working studio for design and for my art practice, but I do not know where to do so. And I have concerns about the financial aspects. A designated space in which I could create and play. I've been single for some time and I feel like I have forgotten love or how to love. And the feelings in the dream were struggle, dismay, and fear. And finally, uh, her associations, she says, I think crows are interesting, but their tendency to prey on newly born birds makes them wicked. A net can be used to catch something and to provide safety if one were to fall. It can also signify immobility. I associate the number three with the trinity. So I have to, I'll tell you that I was picking the dreams this morning. This one was very near the top of the pile. And I um, looked at it and I thought, yeah, I like that dream, but I don't know, maybe I should pick something else. And I was making my coffee and I looked out the window and there were three crows right outside on the, on the, <laughs> and I thought, okay, we'll, we'll do that one. Psyche must want us to do that one this morning. So. There were three black crows standing side by side. And the crow in the center is entangled in a net. I'm just holding that. So the image that that evokes for me Uh, and sadly, I have seen this because I live on the water, where um, birds will wind up getting caught in some piece of uh, netting or fishing line, um, and they might even be able to, to fly or escape the water, 
but something has has wrapped around them and is uh, dangerous, of course. So the fact that all three of them are standing side by side suggests that whatever the netting is, that it's a rather small piece of netting that is clinging to the middle crow. And that somehow the crow has been able to also arrive at that place. So it is partially compromised. And there is what I would imagine is a long-term problem that if this netting is not removed, that the issue of being caught with netting around the wings or the feet or the beak is going to become a crisis. One of the things that I have an association to is uh, I was uh, jet skiing out on the Albemarle Sound during the summer, and there's a lot of uh, fishing nets that are put out during the summer, and I saw something flopping in the water, and I went over, and there was a gannet that was caught in one of the nets and was fighting its way to, st to stay alive at the surface, and uh, which is incredibly tragic. So I I've never had to cut um, an animal free of a fishing net, Frankly, I, I'm not even sure that it's legal, but I did anyway. A couple of things that were really interesting is the um, the incredible violence that this bird visited upon me as I was trying to save it. Of course, it's in a panic, so um, it doesn't know what's helping it or hindering it, and that even once I freed it um, out of the water so that it wasn't suffocating, I still had to really wrestle with this bird to cut away all this webbing that was around its face and its its feet in order for it to actually survive. <laughs> My hands were bleeding from uh, trying to rescue this poor creature. Um, so there is a, a kind of panic when an animal is caught in something, mm -hmm. there's a panic in all of us mm -hmm. when we are caught in something. And I have to say that there were other gannets around that were observing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But w when he was flopping in the water, there were no other gannets that were helping. Mm -hmm. But that, that behavior doesn't happen in the wild. Mm hmm so um, I, I love that you brought that story in because I, I think it does take us into a kind of um, kinesthetic or, or sort of somatic uh, 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 experience of the dream, which is always a good thing to do. Um, and first of all, it, it does make me want to ask the question, we don't hear that there's a kind of panic in the crow who's in the net. You know, the other crows seem like they're fairly calmly helping that crow, that middle crow, out of the pickle. But I, I'd be curious if we had the dreamer to know that. You know, what was the sort of, um, you know, the the, the uh, attitude of the three crows? And then it, it, something that might be interesting for this dreamer to do is to kind of um, go into the dream and be that crow in the net and just see how that feels. What does it bring up? Does it bring up? Does it bring up panic? Does it bring up um, surrender and kind of despair? Uh, or is it? Or is it? Is it calmer? It's like, yeah, I just have to wait until this gets cleared away. And there could be really interesting, almost like embodied information in that. And so I, I would, I would want to do that if, if this were my dream. But. If we even just sort of stay, uh, I mean, I think I think the stream is interesting because there's so many different ways you can go with it. But if we want to take a real kind of archetypal approach to it, which it which is not inappropriate because it's it's just this kind of uh, fairly discrete image without a ton of personal associations, we could say, okay, crows. Well, um, alchemically, crows are associated with negredo, 
Um, and, you know, some of their associations, they are, you know, this dreamer says that they're wicked. Um, but, you know, they are associated with uh, darkness and with shadow and uh, with evil sometimes. Um, naturalistically, crows are incredibly intelligent. They are very social. Um, and, you know, I saw something um, because I... I follow crows a lot on Instagram. My Instagram <laughs> feed is full of crows because I, I happen to love crows. Um, and I, I don't know if this is true or not because, you know, these, these memes go around and you have no idea how true they are. But it, it, it was a little story about a, a pair, a crow pair, and crows do pair bond and remain with their single spouse throughout their whole life. They're monogamous. Um, where one of the crows in the pair had had an injury to her beak, and her mate fed her. Like if without that, she wouldn't have survived. Now, I don't know if that's true, but but it but it is true that they're very um, socially connected. That sometimes older crow siblings will hang around and take care of younger broods, that kind of thing. So they do kind of live in these families. Um. Uh, what else about crows? Oh, a mythological crow. Well, these were ravens, but I think that's close enough. Is that um, the Norse god Odin had two uh, ravens that sat on his shoulder, Hugin and Munin, I think were their names. And if I'm not mistaken, those words mean thought and memory. Mm. So there's they're associated with the Norse god Odin. Joseph, am I missing any crow mythologems? Oh, the crow is the trickster in Native American mythology as well. Yes, yes, there it is. So we know that there's something very archetypal that's happening, and that whenever the uh, psyche produces multiples of a thing, it really wants to make sure that we kind of uh, put our attention there. So three crows... And the crows could be activating any number of things in her psychic environment. On one level, we would say that any animal represents instinct. And undoubtedly, crows have certain instincts, which you could research. And as uh, Lisa has said, they're highly social. Um, they bring people gifts if they feed them regularly. It's just wonderful, uh, interesting stories. Yes, they are tricksters, and yes, they are predators, as many successful forest dwellers are. Mm -hmm. So, there are three instinctive forces, and one of these instinctive forces is ensnared. So, that, that begs just an initial question. What instinct is ensnared in this dreamer's psyche? So that would be one place that we would go. And if we think about a crow being caught in netting, that there's something, some human invention, that the crow does not have an instinct or an instinctive response to, which is, of course, the terrible thing that happens. Uh, people throw these plastic six-pack can holders into the ocean, and they wind up around uh, turtles' necks, or they find them in the bellies of large fish, because on an, the instincts don't recognize these very strange modern things. They're not sure what they are, how to defend against them, whether they should fly into them or, or eat them or not. So this instinct has come up against some modern human invention and has failed to know instinctively how to negotiate it and has therefore been trapped in it. And animals that are caught in webbing like that, it is a life-threatening yeah. problem. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think it's, it is kind of an immediate crisis, actually. But 
Um, so I would take the three, maybe. A, well, here's another way you could go with the fact that there's three of them, which three is also in in fairy tales and kind of archetypally, it's an image of something that's in process. So Jung would say that the three is the thing that comes before the fourth, and the fourth is symbolic of wholeness. But a lot of times in fairy tales, we find that there are three brothers, and the first brother screws it up, and the second brother screws it up, and then the third brother gets it right. And a lot of times I, I think that that shows a, a sort of temporal developmental process. It shows, you know, first we try to do something in life, and we can't quite get it done. Then we try again, we still screw up. But the third time, you know, uh, symbolically, it, it's not always the third time. Sometimes it's the 30th time. Sometimes it's the 100th time. But eventually, we figure it out. And we, we handle the relationship better the next time. Or we don't get into the same fight with our partner. Or we recognize that we can uh, deal with our boss in a more skillful way or whatever the issue is. So, so in a, in a way, I, I feel like this dream may indicate that there is a process unfolding. The other uh, piece of the dream that makes me think that this might be part of it is the fact that these two crows on either side of the middle crow seem to know what to do. And, and again, there isn't this sense of it's a sort of panicked pulling, but they're they're working on it. You know, if this... If in real life, if a crow were caught in a, a web, just like you're saying, Joseph, with your story, if caught in a, in a net, it takes time. It takes time to untangle it. It's an untangling process, and and patience is required. And a, and it seems like that middle crow. It seems like all of the crows have patience. So it may be the dream is saying something has been bound, something has been. Um, caught and and uh, stifled and uh, has been unable to um, to move really. I mean, it's kind of paralyzing. But there's a process that's occurring that may take some time where this will get fixed. Well, I think in that mythic way, in that fairy tale world, you know, crows might very well be able to snip and free up, you know, a, a sister crow from mm -hmm. its ensnarement. Of course, that would be hopeful. What we can say is that the very least, the two side crows picking at the netting is focusing an attention on a task. So the instinctive force is to focus on the netting, focus on what the crow is caught in. I don't know whether crows would be able to snip fishing line or, or actually tear plastic free. Probably not. But the dream is demonstrating an activity, and I think offering it to the dreamer, which is you've got to find where you're caught in the netting and you need to start picking at it and trying to free yourself that that that's the focus to be done now as you were saying about what crows symbolize so again if we were to think about this in north mythology so the ravens would fly across the world and as you said they would symbolize memory and knowledge but they also would bring that knowledge to Odin. All right, yeah. They they would collect. They were like uh, journalists, you know, scouts. They would yeah. write information and they would give it back to Odin. So, if the birds were caught in netting, there would be some interruption with access to knowledge and to memory. So. Is there some resistance to knowing something? And Freud discovered all kinds of ways that our egos can not know something. We can be in denial, we can distract ourselves, there's a million other ways. But there's something that I'm not regarding because 
that capacity to regard is is caught up. It's been caught in a net. Now, interestingly enough, this is what we were just talking about in the podcast with uh, Dr. Monk, that there is a way in which the natural individual curiosity that needs to fly freely Mm -hmm. needs to be able to look at things from on high, needs to come down, be suspicious, yeah, you know, the way crows are, they'll look at you with oh, yeah. like a stink oh, yeah. eye and they then are. they'll <laughs> kind of fly off. You know, they're, they're very cautious about what they're, they're going to extremely cautious. get involved in, but they are tremendously alert and very awake. Yeah, yeah. And just as we were talking about with this identity synthesis, that that free mercurial soaring capacity to look and know and think can get caught in a net that is not of our own making. Mm. And what a powerful metaphor for getting caught in an echo chamber Mm. where I'm only hearing back from social media the story that um, I originally inquired about Mm -hmm. or have got caught in the net of some politician's rhetoric, and I've suddenly absorbed it as my own, although it's never occurred to me to think that way before. So we can get caught. Our minds, which need to fly freely, can get caught in all kinds of nets, and then we are not being, we are not accessing objective information. Yeah, and she says, I've been single for so long, I think I've forgotten love or forgotten how to love. And I wonder if that's, you know, that's a net, is maybe even a belief. A, a belief that, um, you know, that, that something is no longer possible when, of course, it is. Right, that her crow of love is <laughs> uh, caught, caught in something that's limiting it. Mm-hmm. Um. Something else, in Greek mythology, Apollo is said to have turned the crow's feathers black as punishment for delivering bad news. So this also links to the Odin piece. Are we locking up a capacity to know what is true because it's too painful? Mm -hmm. How many of us say that? I just can't look at the news anymore. I I just can't, I can't tolerate knowing something, and particularly in that myth, knowing something that is really and deeply, deeply upsetting. So we kind of throw a shroud of refusal to know Mm -hmm. or avoidance. We get caught in the story that I can't take it, which is a really problematic story. Mm -hmm. As something you had said, Lisa, that they're often seen as omens, uh, dark omens. Mm -hmm. And because crows and ravens were always present at battlefields, and so they are associated with war, yeah. Because they are carrion birds. So as as the dead animals and humans began to litter the battlefields, the crows would circle looking for opportunities to feed. Mm-hmm. Now, right now, you know, we are in a time where wars and stories of wars and rumors of wars are filling the collective narrative. And the part of us that may want to cast a net around the crows of war, to inhibit, to somehow stop what's happening, or at least limit the news of war coming to us Although the instinctive forces would say, you can't stop, you can't stop knowing reality. You can't throw a net 
over the crows of war mm-hmm. yeah. and still expect to be healthy. Yeah. So there's many different perspectives and many different mythologic resources to look at. And often when a dream is so short yep. and uh, we don't have the dreamer with us, then we really need to lean into the archetypal associations yes. in order to at least speculatively mm-hmm. pray uh, you know, to uh, work with it in one way or another. Yeah, that is a really interesting image. And um, it was nice to spend some time with the crows. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.